chairperson of the Animal Shelter Advisory Committee, I hereby call this meeting to order at 12 p.m. Um, at this time, the committee welcomes any public comment. Issues or concerns not on the regular agenda may be raised by the public at this time. Citizens should speak from the podium, address all comments to the committee, begin by stating their name and address or single member district number, and limit their remarks to less than three minutes. Are there any members of the public who wish to make a comment at this time? My name is Susan Perry and I live at 266 Buffalo Lane. And my comments are basically um, financial. Um, I have been trying to get some kind of a handle on whether or not the city is planning on doing renovations to the shelter. Um, I know y'all as part of your bylaws are supposed to be out there once a month. The place is falling apart. And it's really not fair to the animals if you take no for an answer. I know they, they say, okay, we're going to give you this much money. Well, then they split it with something else. And then they, they don't put it as part of the strategic plan. And, and then it just kind of goes away. So I would like to know what the plan is to begin with. The second thing is when... There are a lot of new programs like Dogs Playing for Life and the spay and neuter programs and the adoption programs and trying to fund outdoor play yards and kennel runs and bathing facilities and all of that. Where is the city in this? Concho Valley Paws is turning themselves wrong side out every day trying to raise money. And this is supposed to be a city shelter. And as a city shelter, the city should be ponying up some kind of money to help out. When we are not making any inroads in the number of dogs and cats that are being admitted to the shelter year on year on year, especially after we have ordinances in place, to be able to get dogs and cats spayed or neutered. There's something wrong with that. Now, I know that y'all had asked the city for $10,000 towards spay and neuter, and they turned you down. Well, I'd like to know what we all need to do to get their attention, because they're not paying attention. I think they need to go out to the shelter once a month and take a look around. I know Tommy Hebert has but I don't know of any other city council person that's been out there to tour the facility. Now, animal shelters doing the best they can with what they've got, but Concho Valley Paws cannot do everything else. You know, they're trying to, they're always on the run trying to raise money and get grants and do all this stuff, and there doesn't seem to be any support from the city. So that's kind, I have a whole long list of other stuff, but that's about my three minutes. I know that in y'all's goals and objectives, part of that was to have new facility and new adoption facility, new shelter by the 2021 fiscal year. I would like to know if y'all are planning on redoing your goals and objectives to be a little bit more reasonable to the situation that we have. You know, if we are not, um, you can write a ticket to somebody because they have not spayed or neutered their pet. But if there's no teeth behind that, why should they? Okay, you tell them, show up. Well, okay, well, we're, we're going to give you a 50% off. No. Why can't they do a program like they do for warrants, where they say, okay, everybody that has a warrant, you've got to a certain point in time to address it. People need to be put on notice. You need to address it. If you qualify for a spay or neuter voucher, fine, you need to do something about it. But to just continue month after month after month, nobody's paying any attention at all 
to the fact that it's been an ordinance since 2015. But something needs to be done to enforce it, and the city needs to get behind it. So that's all I have to say. Thank, Thank you, you so all much. so much. Are there any other public comments? If there's no more public comments, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as published. Second. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I hear a motion from Member Murphy and a second from Member Aker. Uh, calling for the vote, all of those in favor say aye. 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 Um, moving on to the regular agenda, the first item is consider election of a chairperson and vice chairperson to terms ending January 2024. So what I have before the committee today is the election of chair and vice chairperson. Um, that is something we're required to do each January, but this is our first meeting of the calendar year. So that's why it's on the agenda for today. Um, it is a one-year term. And as a reminder, um, so it would be for the, it's a one year term, but we're mid term. So it would be through January 31st, 2024 um, is what's before you today. And just as a reminder, here's everyone's um, term statuses so that you would know, um, you know who's available to, to serve in that way. I'd like to nominate Caitlin Wiley for chair and Bambi Aker for co-chair or vice. Second. Okay. Um, I, sorry. I hear a motion from Member Murphy and a second from Member Carpenter. Um, calling for the vote, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed um, say okay. Um, that has been approved unanimously. Moving on to the second agenda item, uh, discussion and possible action related to monthly shelter numbers for February 2023. And I'm getting a note if everyone could be just closer to their mics. I appreciate y'all being patient with our setup here. Okay, as Caitlin mentioned, uh, first um, discussion item we have here is our performance for the month of February. Um, I have it for a little bit different uh, format for y'all this time. We just were creating this graphic for the website and social media, and I thought it was really impactful to share, share with this group as well. Um, and I do have our traditional um, reporting that we ordinarily do um, just so that y'all are familiar and satisfied with um, the information you're getting. Um, so this infographic that we're sharing is specifically about uh, data for cats and dogs. Um, but of course, we also serve livestock and wildlife. Um, so for the month of February, I'll... I might just jump to the, the excellent part. Uh, February 2023, our live release rate was 96.89%. Um, that is the third highest in our history. It's remarkable. Um, February is traditionally our, um, our slowest season, meaning kitten season hasn't started yet. Um, puppy season hasn't precisely started yet. Um, so it is uh, quite common that February, March would be our highest performing um, months. Um, but just of note, the only times we've beat this number were in February 2021, uh, which was shortly after the statewide um, snowstorm, where we had tremendous outreach from New England, who came in and pulled a number of pets from our shelter. Um, so it was in response to an emergency um, that we were able to um, exceed this number uh, the first time. Uh, we also exceeded it in September 2022, as we dealt with the pest control issue and the overcrowding of canines. So again, an emergency is what drove that second time that we were, you know, uh, outperforming this. So for February 2023, uh, we did not precise, we didn't have a specific emergency to uh, point to, uh, just had really great performance. Um, so our intake, we were at 160 dogs and cats came in. 
And you'll see that breakdown of 103 um, dogs came in stray, 32 cats came in stray. Um, then the next category of dogs and cats owners surrendered, you'll see on that chart. And then the next category is seized. And that would just be anything animal um, services officers are bringing in as part of a case um, that could that's most frequently bite quarantine is what you're seeing there, which is why you're seeing dogs and not much else under um, seized. Uh, we did additionally take in 13 um, livestock and 29 wildlife. So our total intake for the shelter was 202 animals. As I mentioned, this is just reporting cats and dogs. Uh, we thought that was the most impactful data for um, the community. Additionally, um, we'll move on to that middle part of the chart with outgoing animals. You'll see the green bar um, as, as dogs, um, adoptions, uh, there we had 58 dog adoptions and 12 cat adoptions, 60 um, dogs returned to owner, four cats returned to owner, 11 dogs transferred out, 33 cats transferred out, and you'll see a greater level of detail just under that bar chart. There is a transfer breakdown. Um, of the pets that left, the 44 pets that left on transfer out to rescue, uh, four were outside Tom Green County, uh, 40 were local, and that was all Concho Valley paused. The 33 cats that left were part of our um, spay-neuter uh, release program. Uh, they, of course, pull those cats, spay-neuter them, and um, so that is a transfer out to them. And then seven animals, uh, dogs, were um, transferred out to them related to a medical a significant medical issue. Um, back up to that middle bar chart, the uh, number of pets euthanized, we had four dogs and one cat euthanized, um, and no uh, deaths in custody uh, for the month of February. So very low deaths this month, of course, supporting that 96% uh, live release rate. Um, that left our animal population at 175 dogs on site um, at the shelter itself, the city shelter itself, six cats on site, which is remarkable. Um, our cats have left through life-saving means. When we're carrying six cats on the premises, that's, I don't know, dozens, hundreds less than we've carried in the past. Uh, we're going into kitten season this year, really lean on cats, um, and that is um, um, local adoptions, that is, um, um, return to field for community cats, um, and that is the vast majority of, of their what's on premises. Um, so really, really great performance on cats. Um, certainly the stress of the shelter environment is anything we want to avoid for them. Um, so we had a total of 260 pets left on premises. I mentioned just now what's at the shelter because of course we are living within that finite capacity and always want to be um, transparent with our performance there. Uh, the remainder of um, cats and dogs were either in foster or other. Other is either medical, um, like at the vet still being treated for something through our partnership with Concha Valley Paws, or in home quarantine for a bite incident. Um, and then we had one, nope, sorry, I'm thinking about March. So that is, um, in a nutshell, in a screenshot with lots of good information, really how our February performance went. Um, again, I have the detail as y'all are used to seeing it, but I won't, uh, I'll respect your time enough not to repeat myself. The um, seven, we rep reported um, the deaths on that infographic, um, but another way to report that, whether it was euthanasia or death in custody, um, it was one cat, four dogs, and two other. Uh, one was an injured possum. Um, we do have possum rehabbers that we work with, but this was beyond um, anything that that uh, pet could, animal could survive. Um, and then one, we had a raccoon um, that did have to be tested for rabies. So that's that two other um, there. Another way to break that down is it was either uh, three of the pets that are animals that died were part of a sick or injured, and then four were uh, due to aggression. We'll take public comment in a moment on this item. Um, so for the outcomes by type, this is something that um, we've been reporting to you. We've had some uh, aggregate data from our mentor groups that 
um, you know, best practices would be this many pets returned to owner, this many pets um, are transferred out. Um, and we're further delving into that. We're going to revamp this a little bit because we're seeing, uh, you know, if, if you if you show the averages of what our best practices should be, you can really carve that out to be different for shelters serving an urban um, population and shelter serving a rural population. And although we're a mid-sized city um, and we're a, a, a good-sized city with lots of amenities, we operate a lot like a rural community. We we um, So we are seeing our numbers more in line with a rural community, and we're going to have some better info on that as the, that report um, continues to come out with more data. Um, but just any time, we're, we're, we're at 32% uh, for return to owner. That's remarkable. 29% of our pets left by adoption, also amazing. Um, so really, um, really pleased with our performance for February. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. When a dog is euthanized, are, are those dogs that are just being brought in or are those dogs that are currently housed at the shelter? I guess part part of part of my question, and I don't really know how to phrase this, um, we get a, a euthanasia list periodically that says we have to eliminate six dogs or nine dogs or whatever by a certain date, or they're going to be euthanized. Well, some of the dogs are are lovely dogs. I mean, I've walked them myself, so I know they're lovely dogs, and so. I don't, what criteria do you use to put them on the list? And if, if you could find a way to adopt out 10 other dogs, why don't those dogs then fall off the list unless this is a, totally a space thing and it's not an aggression thing? Um, does that even make sense? Yeah, when we publicly share a list... Um it is entirely a space thing. We do have a new um, capacity that we're living in, meaning that we can never at any time exceed 180 dogs on the premises. Mm -hmm. And so when we pick six faces to list on social media uh, to our partners, to um, the public to say these six faces have to be saved, um, it is because we're approaching capacity. And we have to be, we wanna be transparent uh, with the public, and we um, have no more um, aggressive dogs to euthanize and no more medical um, to euthanize, and all we are housing is pets that are nice and adoptable and good, um, in which case we're going to um, ask the public for that feedback. Are these six faces worth saving? Help me make the decision of who dies when we're full, to be blunt. Well, if, if the public shows up and say, well, None of them on this six on this list are for me, but this six over here I'll take. Why doesn't it save the six on the list? If it's a space thing, if you're saying you have to get rid of six, you pick six to advertise, and that's great because it gets a face out there and it gets people's attention. But if you've then adopted out six other dogs, during the same time frame because somebody wanted something totally a different color. Why don't one of the, off the euthanasia list then go back to his kennel? Like, because it's still the same space. It's, it's something we can explore. We've never had to face it, thankfully. So um, every time we share nice, good dogs with mm -hmm. a deadline, um, they are being saved. Um, we need those, those specific faces saved um, because if, if others are adopted, we're, we're adopting every day. I know. Right? So this is above and beyond normal adoptions. This is above and beyond average traffic. This is these six faces um, need to be saved. And if I share those faces with the community and they say, no, I'm not coming for them, I have to believe them. At what point do I just keep them in their kennel forever? That's not better. That's not better for the dog. Um, it's not better for the eventual adopter that get, gets a dog that's been in my facility for 
months and months, over a year, whatever that time frame is. And so if I say this very precious to me face will be euthanized at this day and time if y'all don't come for it, I have to believe them when they say, no, I'm not coming. So if they're not coming when it's on a euthanasia list, when would ev whenever would anyone come for that pet? Well, I mean, it's the same thing with some of the dogs that have been there for 18 months and all of a sudden somebody shows up, that's the one. That's sure, just, but if we are one. transparent with the public and our partners and say, this is this pet's last chance and, and it's still a no, what else would save that pet? That's, so we've not had to cross that bridge. We are successfully saving every single time we share a list like that. Um, but that has that that is why we developed the policy the way we did. Okay. Thank you My name is Juliana Evans. I live in San Angelo. I'm a former employee of the city shelter of the city of San Angelo I was fired by Ms. Chetwin and my question is for Morgan and I Having heard Susan's question. I still don't understand why if you have you have six dogs over capacity, so you need to have six dogs adopted. Why, when you have six dogs from the general population adopted, why do the dogs on the list not drop off the euthanasia list? And I understand all the arguments for we can't keep dogs forever, and we are making desperate attempts to have the public aware of these dogs, but it's still your answer before did not address why. If you have 186 dogs, six of which have been highly advertised, and six dogs get adopted, so you're back at your 180 dog capacity. Why are those dogs that were on the euthanasia list still to be euthanized? I have a second question which relates to your figures about dogs being euthanized for aggression. I'd like to know what the policy is for deciding what is an aggressive dog and what procedures are in place to have more than one person determine that. Um, so there's never a moment I can be over 180, e ever. So if I am at 186 and adopt out these six and I'm still at 180, I still have a dog coming in the door. I still have an injured pet coming in. I still have a bite dog coming in for quarantine. So I don't just need to adopt the six faces. I need to adopt more than six mm -hmm. out or rescue transfer them out. So beyond what previous discussion we've had, it's, there's no mystery to it. It's as simple as, as, as what we've stated. I understood that previously, if you had six dogs on an E-list and six dogs, other dogs were adopted, then those dogs on the E-list did get dropped from the E-list. I was advised that by the executive director of Concho Valley Paws. That is something that seems to have changed recently, and I'm still at a loss to understand why. Understanding completely that you have to remain under your maximum capacity. It is new. Um, the maximum capacity was set in November. Um, the policy I just described to Ms. Perry was set in March. So it is new. Uh, we are Why? stretching our muscles to learn how to live within this new capacity <coughs> and how to avoid the euthanasia of adoptable pets, which we have successfully done to date. So what was the basis on which the, the new policy was determined? Uh, what I just described to Ms. Perry was the basis. I don't, I'm sorry, could you repeat it? Because I didn't hear it. I don't know that we have the, the capacity to, to repeat what's already been stated. Okay, so you don't want to answer the question. Let's move on. This to is my, being recorded and can be watched. Let's back. move on to my second question, which was what what is the what are the determining factors for deciding that a dog is aggressive, um, particularly when a dog's been in a shelter for a number of months and has been available for adoption, clearly not aggressive, and then suddenly appears to be categorized as aggressive and therefore placed on an E list. What is the process? In that regard, I can't. You'll, say that you'll be aware that I helped ad adopt out numerous dogs that you personally considered aggressive. Yet they went to fantastic homes. They had been perfectly adoptable for for days, weeks, months. In some cases, years. Some of those dogs you congratulated me on helping get them adopted. Yet others, you. It appears there was a decision one day that dog is now aggressive. We're high on numbers. Let's euthanize the dog. I don't understand the procedure. I'm not necessarily criticizing it. I'm trying to better understand the reasoning behind selecting a dog as aggressive when it clearly hasn't been 
for such a long period of time? We're very much in a transition um, time. So anything that happened months ago, even even 60 days ago, um, new policies and new uh, protocols um, have changed. So any decisions that were made or any action that was taken even 60 days ago, uh, we're not upper operating under those uh, policies any longer by and large. So. Um, I can't speak to, so what I just described um, in, in previous statements and what, um, um, what's going on right now is, is the current um, process. So how, how do the public become aware of those changes in processes? It's not uh, for public review. Okay, so I guess then I'm taking that the answer to my second question is, uh, we'll just change policy and there's no accountability? There's a tremendous amount of accountability. The, um, the professionals and experts trained to um, set policy and procedure for such matters are the ones doing so. One thing that is unchanged um, over the last 60 days of policy setting is that it does take four people to sign off on a euthanasia, two um, city staffers and two PAWS uh, representatives. Um, so we do have that 360 review of a pet's um, temperament and demeanor before taking any final action. I understand from a previous employee at the shelter that that was previously the policy. There were four people well before the turn of the year and then that's that four people were involved in make, making a determination and there had to be a consensus. So when did that stop being the policy and then restart being the policy and what was the reason for it? I guess to repeat myself, that is unchanged. It is still the policy. I find that difficult to believe given that one of the dogs I was uh, instrumental in having adopted I spoke with the executive director of Concho Valley Paws, and she advised that she had no idea the dog had been selected for euthanasia. Can you address that? I don't know which pet it's in reference to, but there's, we're not taking final action without looping in all the, the members selected. I, and I also believe we're well beyond three minutes. I, I don't know and what else I can say unless to, to satisfy your question. Unless one person isn't telling the truth, then that would seem to have not been the case. I was told very clearly in a direct conversation that uh, there had been no knowledge that that particular dog had been selected for euthanasia. So, again, I guess you're not going to address it here, but I just well, want I, I my comments made I don't believe I can. Public. I don't know which pet you're speaking of, and I don't have that information in front of me. So you aren't able to address it because you don't have the information. As Ms. Chegwedden said, she does not have the information in front of her. I do believe your three minutes are up for comment. Fine. Um, moving on to item C, discussion and possible action related to monthly shelter numbers for March 2023. Again, we'll spend the bulk of our time on the infographic. I think, um, I mean, we welcome your feedback, but we think that this um, serves us well and wanted to try to um, let this really well-crafted document have an additional audience. Um, our total intake for all species was 267 uh, for the month, 235 were cats and dogs, and you do see that breakdown there. Of course, stray dogs continues to just outpace all of our intake across all categories and species. Um, into our outgoing animals, um, the 57, 56 adoptions, um, 70, I'm so sorry. So you'll see um, local adoptions there, um, return to owner, uh, 62 dogs and one cat. Uh, transfers out were at um, 72, so uh, really um, good uh, progress there. Uh, we did have more pets um, euthanized. Uh, of course, you'll see there 11 dogs and uh, three cats. Um, no dogs died in custody and two cats did die in custody. Uh, so a, way to break, a further way to break down that uh, transfer out, uh, 34 were outside Tom Green County. So we did have, I believe, two transports uh, for the month of March. Um, that was all dogs. Um, and then 38 um, pets were transferred out to local rescues. Um, 17 to pause for the community cat program I described, as well as 21 to pause for um, significant medical. 
We ended our um, population on the premises. Our total up uh, left in custody was 286 pets. 174 were dogs on site, so still staying under that capacity. 16 cats on site, so up a little bit, but still tremendously low on cats. The remainder of our pets were um, in foster and other. Um, in addition to what's reported in this infographic, we did have one potbelly pig um, serving out his stray hold on the premises. He has since been adopted, and you'll see that in our April performance. Uh, so for March 2023, our live release rate was 92.86%, certainly down from February, um, but respectable um, performance overall. Another way to break down that um, deceased number uh, were three cats, 11 dogs, and one other. It was a possum, uh, again, that was injured um, beyond rehab. Um, another way to break that down, it was eight animals um, sick or injured, uh, nine aggressive dogs. And then again, we're working through this, but really anytime we're at about a third, a third, a third, a third of our pets leaving by adoption, a third by return to owner, and a third by the other, then that's you know a good uh, month and good performance there. So that is your March in a nutshell. Are there any questions related to this item? There's no further questions. Moving on to item D, discussion and possible action related to community supported sheltering model. So we always wanna bring uh, y'all something each and every meeting about um, furthering life-saving and what we can do uh, for more and continued um, life-saving of pets in our care. Um, we've spent a lot of time um, getting training and seeking out more information about a shift in the industry, a model called community-supported sheltering. Um, this is something we a little bit stumbled into, right? That we had the, um, the emergency in September. Um, we had been communicating for months uh, that we were at an overcapacity for canines. Um, and in September, we were able to um, communicate that to the public, had a huge um, swell of support, um, but of course swore that, that that would never happen again, that we would never carry that many um, dogs on, on the premises at any given time. And so setting that capacity and um, asking finders of pets to uh, participate in our Good Sam program, asking Good Sam's to transition to foster where available, um, asking um, owners of pets to um, you know, participate in a number of ways to get reunited with their pet. Um, those are all things that we stumbled into and then learned the label of it is community supported sheltering. And so I wanted to bring this to the group that this is the model. It's not um, to describe what we're doing now. Some of the things we're doing uh, quite well and we're doing now and it's um, serving us well. Some of the things are aspirational and something we would like to move towards. Um, and some of the things we may not have the appetite for, they don't exactly fit in San Angelo. Um, so I'll, I'll go through the model and, and, and how it's um, framed and adopted. Um, this is uh, from our mentor groups. Um, they've spent a, a lot of time um, delving out, you know, really defining what this means. Um, so it is the, the highest level of engagement possible. It's a lot of public involvement and support. Um, it's, um, it's meant to be um, the community, the government shelter, um, rescues coming together and working towards, we may all have different um, uh, motivations of why we make the choices we do, but we all are working towards a life-saving vision and saving as many pets as possible. Um, and it's meant to protect the and serve the most vulnerable pets and people. Um, one thing that we um, use in our vernacular, you know, in-house as we're coordinating with um, finders of pets, um, owners of pets, is that we want to... Um, reserve taxpayer dollars, the, the government facility for those most vulnerable pets, uh, those that are a danger to themselves or others. So if there's a dog in traffic, it's coming in whether I'm full or not, right? Like that's not a, that's not a situation where um, uh, 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 unless there's a good Sam or a foster available, well, even a foster, right? It would have to have its stray hold, but just 
we're not going to leave a pet in an unsafe situation and we're not going to leave the community in an unsafe situation. So to the extent uh, a dog is displaying aggressive tendencies on first response, we're going to go ahead and impound that pet. Very frequently that dog turns around and is, is a very nice dog and, and, and we continue our assessment and our return to owner efforts. But in that moment, um, at the first response from animal services officers or even uh, law enforcement, we're impounding that animal. That's the most important thing is, is the pu public um, safety. Um, so one thing about community supported sheltering is that um, the public engages with a sense of ownership and responsibility. Um, I, we are the shelter that this community wants us to be. And to the extent they want to support life saving and continue no kill San Angelo and have the appetite to continue adopting and fostering from our facility and maintaining ownership of their pets, then we're going to continue to do this. And so it's very responsive to the public and, 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 and their resources to come alongside us and, and be part of it. Um, it also talks a lot about um, that our policy and enforcement respects and um, values the public that we've seen for um, years and years of really heavy-handed punitive measures have not yielded responsible pet ownership, have, n have not yielded people voluntarily spay-neutering. I'm sorry, it's just the, the punitive efforts are, uh, don't build rapport with, with, with citizenry, with, with target neighborhoods, with um, pet owners. And so, yes, we want to come in and do enforcement. That's never off the table. Um, but it's uh, about collaborating with those neighborhoods, with those owners to... Um, to be matched with resources and, and become compliant. Um, they talk a little bit about the history here, and I won't um, bore you all with it. You know just locally where we've been um, approaching no-kill. Um, even when I started um, almost six years ago with animal services, we still were sa saving 47% of our pets. Um, so a lot of room for growth there. Um, and um, really just animal control was created over 100 years ago to prevent the spread of disease, specifically rabies. And I think we can check that off. That's happening, right? Like nobody in San Angelo is contracting rabies virus. So um, doing that, that in enforcement and that um, investigations of bite cases is um, so, so, so important to the work that we do, but doesn't take up a tremendous amount of bandwidth any longer. It's, it's something we take quite seriously and are compliant with at the state level, um, but there is room for more, right? We're going to ask our animal services officers as professionals to do more and our staff to do more. Um, so we've evolved from this place where we were catching and killing just m millions of dogs and cats in an inhumane way. And this, n and this next evolution is that we're bigger than a brick and mortar building. There's so many services that we're offering um, outside of uh, my four walls um, that even if it's a no today, hey, I'm full, we're closed for intake, we're going to send you back with this pet, but we're going to match you with resources, right? I'm going to send you home with a crate because I don't have dogs lining the hallways anymore in crates. We're going to send you home with donated food, with puppy pads, with vaccines. We're going to scan that pet for microchip. We're going to get it on all the lost and found sites and, and, and look for it. Um, we also send you home with a yard sign that says, hey, I found a pet and we put a removable label on it. Okay, um, our staff has really built that out um, that says, it's a black and brown chihuahua. And then someone knocks on your door and they're like, my mom's missing a black and brown chihuahua. And that keeps the pet in its home neighborhood. Of course, we continue to quote that 70% of dogs are found within a mile of their home. And putting that back into homes has served us really well. We have built a lot of relationships with our good Sams that are um, just big fans of what we are doing and are happy. Um, you know, nobody stops and pulls over and takes an hour out of their day to chase down a dog, put it in their car, drive six miles across town and knock on my door to say, I don't care what you do with the dog, right? They did all of that because they care about that animal getting somewhere safe. And we say the safest thing for this animal right now is in your home. Do you have a spare bedroom that we can put this crate in? And by and large, people are saying yes. And that's really important to the mission to know that long term, San Angelo is here for no kill. Um, and um, we're, in a, we're, we're we exist to be a valuable resource, even if it's not a shelter intake, right? We're continuing those conversations with our, our, our citizens participating in Good Samaritan um, that hold on to those dogs. By and large, when we reach out and say, hey, the shelter's below capacity, you're approved for an intake, they say, oh, I found the owner. 
you're good. Hey, take me off the list. Uh, move on to somebody else. Um, or my mother-in-law fell in love with the dog. She's going to keep it. Um, and so we stay in touch with those folks. Um, and then if they do decide to keep the dog, we match them with um, microchipping and, and making sure they're aware of spay neuter and um, taking advantage of those resources. But just because th there's the intake that's reserved for our most vulnerable pets, but there's so many other services that we're offering to pets in the community and uh, people in the community. Um, I think we talked about this. You know, what does it mean for shelters? Um, they're not, nobody's saying shelters are going away. Um, it's not that we put all the pets back in the community. That's not at all what we're describing. Um, lots of community cat support. Um, we are going to bring uh, our next agenda item with y'all. We're going to talk about how did we miss no kill last year and what are we doing this year to address that. And it's a lot about cats. We missed no kill last year entirely because of cats. And so our cats are not being well served in our shelter and we are um, working through that. Um, uh, what does it mean for animal control? I mentioned, you know, we don't have dog catchers anymore. We have professional animal services officers that are there to serve pet owners. And the punitive approach is the smaller part of what they're doing in any citizen interaction, right? They're responding to a bite case. Um, they're approving home quarantine where appropriate. They're following up and staying with that property, with that pet owner and saying, you have finished your bite quarantine. Let's go ahead and get you scheduled for your spay neuter. You have complied with your spay neuter. I just need a copy of that to close out my case. And so we're investing in that household. So instead of getting called to that home three, four, five times in a year, now they're compliant, right? They have a secure enclosure. Their pet is current on all um, requirements. Um, they are doing that for their other pets in the home as well. We're enforcing for the whole household. And so we don't get the calls to that home anymore by staying with them and, 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 and keeping them responsible. Whereas even, I mean, definitely 10 years ago, but maybe even five years ago, we would impound that dog, never hear from the people. They just get a new dog and continue that pattern of, um, not responsible pet ownership. So um, the proactive engagement of returning pets to owner in the field, uh, our return to owner is ACES. It's, it's above industry standards. We're really proud of where we are on that. But how many of those can we do before the pet even comes into the shelter? We do a good many, but could it be more? So we're running those metrics now. Um, and there is they, they're very big on using data to drive decision making, and I think that's really important uh, for this group to know. You know, we have a finite amount of resources, um, we have a finite amount of space, and so we want to write our programming around what's really specifically happening. And so, some feedback we've gotten is go back last year. If we missed no kill last year because of cats, specifically kittens dying in care, go look at all your deceased kittens last year. Where'd they come from? Can you make contact with a property owner in the area about doing some really targeted like trap neuter return? Um, let's get those adults in, get them spayed neutered if they haven't done so already so that we don't have more kittens just to be born, just to die in my facility again. And so nobody wants that, um, but that is so, so, and that's something we can, we can accommodate to some degree. We've got our animal services officers in the field. We're already offering something we call a nuisance colony assistance program. This is really just right in line with that, um, not, not um, taking a lot of time off the officer's um, plate, not decreasing, you know, response for service. Um, I think we've talked about this, um, but what does it mean for community members? I've described some specific scenarios um, where folks are showing up in force to say, yeah, I want to help. I'm happy to good Sam this pet. Um, really writing our programs and policies to be more welcoming rather than exclusive, um, that all our communications are crafted to be thoughtful and reflective of diversity. One thing we're working through is um, making all of our handouts and our brochures and our literature um, ADA compliant, so specific uh, fonts and specific you know, um, space so that that is easier for uh, folks with disabilities to be able to uh, receive appropriately. We're also trying to get all of our forms and um, literature out to be bilingual. We do have um, a bilingual staffer um, scheduled out in the field daily as well as one in-house, um, but having um, each of our forms and um, literature uh, in Spanish as well as English I think is really important to move towards. Um, 
I do have a case study that was in our training that we got, but I think you would read this and say, is this case study about San Angelo? And it's that um, it was a, a mid-sized city shelter. It was a large shelter at capacity. Um, they had a weather event moving in, so they had a lot more pets coming in, and they had pop-up crates all over. They had them in, in the hallways. They had them in multi-purpose rooms, and that's where we were living um, you know, seven months ago. Um, one thing that they had is you know, our state veterinarian comes annually to do our inspection and is supportive of no kill as long as we're still compliant with state law, which we are. Um, but in this scenario, the state veterinarian actually formally recommended you have to um, kill pets to get down of capacity. Um, you cannot house this many animals. Um, I don't care how you make them go. If you want to try to let them leave by life-saving means, great. But if you cannot, you have to euthanize get to, to get down to an appropriate capacity. Um, and so the shelter was transparent uh, about that order that they received. They went to the media. They went to the community and asked for help and um, got that support. And they were able to permanently decrease their population um, and uh, the, the director was new, and they said, if I'm going to have to euthanize adoptable pets, I need the public's feedback on what that's going to look like. And instead, they were able to provide for life-saving um, outcomes for those animals and remove the, um, the pop-up crates as an appropriate housing um, for shelters. So that's... That's almost textbook for what we experienced recently. I don't know if it makes us feel any better that other shelters are facing the same thing, but that's just that's what community-supported sheltering is about. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I have another case study here, but I want to be respectful of y'all's time. Um, but just to reiterate that um, community-supported sheltering is not one single program. It's having cohesion across all of our programs, that they're all serving people well, um, and, and we match those opportunities um, um, with folks in need. Are there any questions to this item? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name's Tina Leach, and I live at 202 Las Lomas Court. And it's, it's really just a, a comment or a question on top of this. Um, I'm new to the community. I moved here uh, 15 months ago, and I thought, what can I do um, since I'm only working part-time now? Uh, so I addressed the meals for the elderly, and I found out what opportunities were at the shelter. One thing that's concerning uh, for the shelter right now is... Um, I like to walk dogs, but it is limited because you can walk dogs when you are a volunteer through the Humane Society next door, which is the CV Paws. And I would just like, if we're going to make changes and involve the community and we're going to work together with all organizations working together, it'd be nice if those hours were expanded for volunteering. For example, it was really hot already today at 11 o'clock. And on a Saturday, I don't want to start my walking of dogs come July and August at 11 o'clock. So if we want those dogs uh, specifically that are in shelters to have some kind of grace when people come to look at them for adoption, they need an outlet. And I believe that you'll get a little bit more help when those hours are expanded. Now, I don't know who controls those hours. Um, no one really watches me when I go in there and take a dog out of a crate um, in order to walk him. I think I've got the education that I got through CV Paws. Um, I'd like to see that those hours are more expanded. I think you're going to get volunteers to come in and walk those dogs and give them a little bit of sanity. Um, and anyway, so that's a request just to see, please try to strike up how we can do better with, I mean, I'd like to come in on a Sunday. I have time on a Sunday. Um, I don't want to get in the way. I just like to walk a dog. And I know lots of other people that said the same thing these last couple of weekends. Um, the next thing is just kind of an eye-opening, and you probably already know this. I am not a social media gal, but I got on Nextdoor app. Ooh, boy, are they vicious to uh, the animal shelter. Um, you may want to monitor those things and correct some of the misgivings that people are putting out there, such as, this dog bit my dog, and when you call, there's no response. Um, doesn't sound like um, people are responding when they're calling, but you know, people just ventilate um, on the next door app. So if this information is going out, it really would be nice if it was blasted to the community through 
the newspapers, however that is, in order to get people to understand what the shelter is doing. One of the reasons I came to this is just to find out what you do. Just because I'm out there, I don't understand how it works. So I do hope it gets better, and I think the public would stand uh, behind you if it knew that information. You know, when you, when you sought um, the emergency fostering in September, of course there was one, I don't even know this person by name, but there was this one person who, you know, she was the glamour girl of the community who went in and took those pictures of the dogs rolling in their own feces. Well, of course they do that because they go back in and they're not out long enough to walk to go to the bathroom outside and then they rambunctiously roll in it um, and those are the pictures she posted of the conditions of the shelter. So let's not have those conditions in the shelter ever for people to see and I just would like to say that um, I think this needs to be opened up to the public more, however you do that, to say these are the things that we do when you show up with a stray. Because right now the public thinks, if I hold on to a dog for three days, the city says it's mine, and now if I do something to get rid of that stray, I go to jail. That's what they think. Read the next door app and you'll find out what the public is thinking right now. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions related to this item? Um, this really touches on what Tina was talking about, volunteers. Is there a reason that the shelter, if, if you have people that were, were trained by, by PAWS to do things with the shelter and walk dogs and et cetera, that they can't work for the shelter when PAWS is not open for adoptions because I can't do three o'clock in the afternoon during the summertime. I can do eight or nine o'clock in the morning and it's a lot more pleasant, but PAWS has their hands full with all the other stuff that they have to do. And so their open adoption hours are very limited, but that's the only hours that we are allowed to go and walk dogs because we have to be under somebody's umbrella. So my question is, why won't the city or the animal shelter allow people that have already been trained to come in on different hours, Mondays and Tuesdays, uh, Sundays, if there's, if there's somebody there? I mean, I understand you don't want to turn people loose and have a dog eat them or something. You know, I understand that, that there needs to be responsible people there. But I think that people at the animal shelter are responsible, and we would be doing the same exact thing for them as we're doing for PAWS, just in different hours. Um, the other question I have is how <laughs> the shelter passes statewide veterinary inspection with the drainage issues and stuff that they have. You can't give a dog a bath. If, if a dog happens to, better dog food would eliminate a whole lot of the loose poop. But you go out, walk those dogs, almost every one of them has diarrhea. So if that dog gets put back shortly after its kennel got cleaned, it does all its business and then it's running in it all day long. Well, you can't even take it out and give it a bath because there's no drainage there to be able to do that. So I don't understand what a veterinarian is looking at because he should be looking at the physical facilities also. And the physical facilities are a mess. And that is no knock on the animal shelter people. They're, they are hustling every day. It's no, no knock on paws. It's kind of a knock on the city because the city is not paying attention. And I think everybody would be way more inclined to come out and volunteer if the circumstance was a little more pleasant. I have to force myself I apologize started. to interrupt you. You're That's, at three minutes. That's fine. Thank you. Any other questions related to this item? 
If there are not, we'll move on to item E, discussion and possible action related to the enforcement and funding of spay neuter of cats and dogs required for pets inside city limits. Uh, we do have this item. It was requested by um, two committee members, and we've had a, a number of conversations at the council level um, that I realized that y'all had not um, been privy to, so I wanted to bring that level of uh, information to y'all. Um, of course, the spay-neuter ordinance was adopted in October 2015, stating that an owner's responsible um, for spay-neutering their cats and dogs. Um, and we've been through several... Um, ways of how we've enforced that. Um, when it was adopted, it was always adopted to be a, um, and I'm sorry, that says proactive. It's, it's meant to say, um, okay, that it, it was always intended to be reactive enforcement, um, meaning that um, we can't simply knock on someone's door and say, hey, show me uh, your pet and their proof of ownership. There does have to be um, a suspicion that, that there is a violation. Um, it, it's, it's enforced um, currently in tandem with other responses. Um, so when we're there for a loose dog or you're redeeming your pet from the shelter or you um, are um, there for a bite case, as I, I described a scenario earlier. Um, so it's similar to, a city ordinance also requires each pet to be microchipped, and state law, of course, requires the rabies vaccine. Um, right now, when we saw our increase in puppy intake last year, we continued to see just a tremendous amount of unwanted litters and um, puppies running uh, loose in the community that um, if, if we respond to you and you are subject to a citation, you're unlikely to get a citation for failure to microchip or failure to rabies vaccinate. We're going to prioritize the spay-neuter compliance. Um, that is the number most, one most important thing um, um, f uh, that's putting no kill at risk right now, um, in my opinion. Um, and we had moved from a practice where we were educating families, referring them, giving them a 10-day grace period, um, and following up at a later date to issue a citation if they weren't compliant. And we found that we just couldn't continue to that. That kind um, outreach was not um, yielding um, necessary support. Um, as I mentioned, fiscal year 22, specifically winter 2022, which is not normally puppy season, um, we had our, our young canine intake, so anything under six months of age, had increased 27% year over year. Um, and that is how we wound up with dogs in crates lining the halls, a bunch of cat rooms repurposed for puppy rooms, um, office space repurposed for puppy rooms, and um, it really contributed to our canine overpopulation just six months later um, we were, when we were in crisis. Um, so we still want to work with families. Um, Contra Valley Paws has been uh, generous enough to provide spay-neuter vouchers there at the time of redemption. So if we have a pet owner that we're working with and they take advantage of the spay-neuter voucher through Paws, um, then they are um, May, they don't get a, a ticket right then and there if it's our first interaction with them. Um, if they um, opt out of a spay-neuter voucher, then they, they are subject to that citation. We also um, worked through a new process with um, city attorney to... Um, where we're actually filing retroactively on folks that have already been notified. Like we had some kind of interaction with them, whether it was a bite or a owner redemption across the counter. Um, and then we're following up now at this point saying, you know, we, we told you you had to spay neuter. Um, we gave you a deadline to complete that. You have yet to do so. Um, so we are uh, or to provide the proof of that. Um, so we are now filing those after the fact um, through the municipal court and have created a tremendous amount of um, um, such filings for the um, city attorney's office and municipal court to work through, and that's 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 where we are. Um, as I think that the the request for the item today was to talk about um, um, council funding some sort of assistance program. In addition, to, you know, we're relying on the generosity of, of Contra Valley Paws, and um, but resources are are finite, and um, any investment would be put to good use. Um, we also, you know, what else can we be doing enforcement to that? I would um, defer to, you know, our attorneys to say what else we, we can be doing. Um, but it's, it's certainly, you know, not all no-kill communities have a spay-neuter ordinance. Um, it's also something that they necessarily put into law. They are encouraging it and matching people with resources. Um, but we do have this very valuable law to, to no-kill programming, um, and we, 
you know, to the extent that we're not saving 90% of our animals, we have to look at this as, as one failure that's contributing to that. Um, and just the number, I mean, y'all see it too, the number of, of kittens being born, the number of puppies being born that um, were not, um, either were bred without a permit by a breeder or um, free breeding occurred and a citizen, you know, has an unwanted litter. Um, it's just, it, it puts a tremendous strain on, um, on our resources as uh, well as our partner's resources. Of course, we contract with Concha Valley Paws for a number of things, including adoption and uh, medical support. Um, they run their, their Mommy and Me program to get the female dog spayed and the puppies uh, adopted or transported out. Um, and it is, those are really valuable and good programs and work, um, but we're seeing um, just more and more folks just not taking advantage of, of those items. Are there any questions with regards to this item? That concludes all regular agenda items. Do we have any follow-up or administrative issues to announce? I'd like to make a comment. Yes, sir. Uh, I know we're getting near the end of the uh, of, of this meeting. Uh, first off, uh, I've been close to a year on the committee. Uh, we don't get too many uh, people that come in and, and speak and stuff. And sometimes I haven't even heard it, but thank you uh, for all y'all coming. We don't really... Uh, I guess say that it does like uh, Morgan's men speaking about community involvement and working together uh, I've been in the government for 30 years uh, with the police department and it, it takes a community to work together with the government to help solve uh, issues and stuff I've also learned uh, we can't make everybody happy but we do try to do our best uh, so uh, if I remember right Susan uh, Tina and I'm sorry ma'am I, I, you were so soft-spoken, I didn't hear your name. Okay, Angela. Uh, I, I do appreciate all y'all's comments and stuff. Don't think that we're just sitting here waiting for y'all to get done and stuff. We are listening, and it does take, uh, um, we do take the information. Uh, I know that we take it back. We try to solve issues, see what we can apply and everything. So I want to thank you for all y'all's comments, even though y'all may not hear it uh, enough. So do thank you for, uh, for that. Also wanted to talk about, I can't remember the company's name, but Morgan did uh, reach out to me and we did uh, get donated uh, four uh, microchip scanners that uh, the police department can carry. Uh, so we are able to, uh, at times when an animal does approach us, we do go out, but most time they run away from us and it's hard to determine if they're aggressive or not to actually call out animal services. But if we do get some that do approach us, we do have the ability now to micro uh, or to scan and to keep that animal in the neighborhood. Because like she said, data shows that they do probably belong somewhere in a neighborhood. So instead of taking them six miles away uh, from where they may be or more, maybe we can get them home faster and then start having that education process with the homeowner or the pet owner, I should say. So but anyways, those are the comments I just wanted to say. But again, also to thank you all for coming out. Stuff. Thank you so much. Um, if there's no more comments or administrative issues, I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. I'll second that. Okay. Um, all, calling for the vote, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Meeting adjourned at 1.02 p.m. Thank you.